The long, low sweep of bodywork absorbs the early morning sun and radiates a warm glow, the candy apple red paint providing the aura of smoldering coals. It's a dreadfully chilly morning in the Mojave Desert as we huddle close to the car to catch some reflected warmth. It's not the first time we'd stood around at Willow Springs International Raceway and gawked at an all-new Ford GT, waiting for clearance to begin hot laps. Seven weeks earlier, we were in this very spot with a black GT awaiting the same test. Our resident pro driver, Randy Pobst, had reported issues with the damping and braking. Then one of the well-worn prototypes' fuel pumps failed. The other fuel pump kept it running well enough to finish the photos you're looking at. All supercars are special, but in an increasingly crowded room, the Ford GT still stands out. Pick your reason. It looks like nothing else. All teardrop cabin and outrigger fenders and flying buttresses in between. It's powered by a twin-turbo V6 with a mysterious anti-lag system and an intake system that incorporates both those fenders and their buttresses. Its suspension makes use of both coil springs and torsion bars and drops the ride height 2.0 inches and slightly longer than the blink of an eye. And FIA certified roll codge is built into the roof. The pedals and steering wheel come to you, not the other way around. That steering wheel feels for all the world like it came out of a real, honest-to-goodness race car. Perhaps because it was designed for a real, honest-to-goodness race car, one that won its class on the first attempt at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. The expectations of this car, stoked by a protracted rollout and delivery process carefully curated to maximize hype, are by now many times its 3,354-pound curb weight some 300 pounds more than Ford's published dry weight. Lines have been drawn for some time now in enthusiast circles, each with its own lofty metric for the GT to live up to. Nearly two years since its unveiling and a year and a half since Le Mans, it's finally time. A day before it showed signs of illness at the racetrack, our first GT told a very different story. Tessmeister Chris Walton found the launch control easy to use with light wheel slip on the way to a 3.0 second dash to 60 miles per hour. More interesting was the second bout of wheel spin at 50 miles per hour when the dual clutch transmission grabbed second under full boost. Less than 8.0 seconds after hitting 60, it blew past the quarter mile mark at 130.5 miles per hour. The results are slightly different by the end of a quarter mile drag. The GTRs and 911 GT3 RS have fallen behind, and the McLaren 650S and 675LT have pulled slightly ahead. Otherwise, the finishing order is the same as it was at 60 miles per hour. For all its straight-line punch, the GT is no Dodge Challenger SRT demon. The Ford is built for corners. Figure rig master Kim Reynolds found the GT predictable and surprisingly easy to drive hard. It basically understares at the limit, he noted, so it's best just to manage it and then pour in power to rotate it out of the corner. It will try to spin if you don't keep a step ahead of it. Frankly, it felt like I had a better time than a 22.7, but so it goes. The finer details, 22.7 seconds at 0.97 average G in the figure 8 and 1.11 average lateral G on the skid pad. How elite is that? Take all the cars listed above, and the GT is faster around the 8 than everything but the Corvette Z06, Viper ACR, 488 GTB, Oregon Performant, 675 LT, 720S, and 918 Spider. Over 1.0 grams on the skid pad is also elite, and the GT's 1.11 is better than any car tested except the Corvette Z06, Oregon Performant. AMG GTR, and 918 Spider and is tied with the ZL11 Leader E and GT3. Its brake pedal is firm, and its stroke is short, but there's a bit of modulation available at the end, Walton said. Stopping from 60 miles per hour takes 95 feet. Generally impressive but mid-pack among supercars. It was at this point the excrement hit the ventilator with our first GT loaner. Just as we were about to hot lap it in anger at Willow Springs, the wounded car was shipped back to Michigan, where Ford diagnosed a blown shock, a damaged wiring harness, 
and an out-of-tolerance break booster. More than 5,000 miles of torture and torment at the hands of the enthusiast press had taken its toll on the early build car. Our testing incomplete. We cajoled Ford to send a replacement for lap time testing at Willow Springs. We were fairly confident in our metered test results for the first car. We can debate whether a dodgy brake booster or fading shock cost us a tenth on the figure eight until we're blue in the face. So we relented that our second vehicle's tests would be limited to high-speed laps.